Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome to the Einstein Forum. My name is Misha Gabovic. I'm a researcher at the Einstein Forum, and I am extremely pleased that Theta Box from the University of Valencia is speaking to us today. This is an event that has been very long in the making uh, since 2019, when I first encountered Theta's work during a, a research stay in Madrid. Um, there is a small change. Uh, Birgit Aschmann from the Humboldt University in Berlin, who was going to chair this event, unfortunately had to cancel on short notice for personal reasons. Um, but the pandemic has one nice side effect, which is that we can involve more people from geographically more distant locations. And I'm extremely pleased that Till Kessler is here with us today to moderate tonight's event. Till is a professor of the history of education at the University of Halle-Wittenberg. He is a specialist in uh, Spanish 20th century history among, among a range of other topics. And uh, he will introduce Thera and chair the discussion. Uh, before he does so, just one technical announcement from me. At the end of the lecture, you will all be able to ask questions. In fact, you can start asking your questions um, during the lecture itself. In order to do so, please do not use the chat function because whatever is typed into the chat is visible to everyone immediately and that can be very disruptive. Instead, please use the Q&A box, questions and answers that you can see at the bottom of your screen. And until as the moderator, will be able to select questions, read them out, and Thera will be able to answer them. Uh, so without further ado, Bill, the floor is yours. Thank you, Misha, and a very warm welcome to everyone. I'm very pleased to uh, function as a moderator for this uh, talk, and uh, I feel very honored to introduce to you uh, Sierra Box from the University of Valencia. And we will uh, have, uh, I will introduce her shortly, then we have a, the talk from Sierra, and then we'll uh, start a, a Q&A session uh, where you will be able to um, uh, ask uh, a question. Uh, I'm pretty sure that not everyone of you is an expert in Spanish history, so please do not hesitate to ask also general questions about uh, Francoism and the Franco period, uh, and uh, we will try, and Zero will try to answer uh, your question as um, much as possible. But now let me introduce our uh, honored speaker, Sierra Bok. She's assistant professor of sociology at the University of Valencia, Spain. And she is um, this rare expert um, who uh, is, uh, has uh, um, extensive knowledge both in the uh, field of social science and of history. This is, uh, I, I find that very intriguing. And in the 1970s, I think, and 1980s, there were a lot more uh, sociologists interested in history uh, at the moment, I think it's it's uh, more the exception than rule, and so I'm more than pleased to have uh, you here uh, with us today, uh, Zira. Uh, Zira Box is a preeminent scholar on the history of early Francoism, and especially on political culture and political cultures in early Francoism. Uh, she's interested in the ideas and imagery um, of uh, Francoist elites of uh, and Francoist intellectuals. Um, like the idea of Castilla, um, among other things. Uh, and she has published extensively on subjects, both in sociologi sociological journals, uh, as well as in historical uh, journals. Um, I just want to uh, mention two recent uh, published volumes in which she um, uh, functioned as a um, co um, uh, editor. Um, one was published uh, in uh, 2019, uh, in Palgraf Macmillan, uh, uh, the title is Reactionary Nationalists, Fascists and Dictatorship Against Democracy, a volume that tries to make sense of uh, different um, fascist and nationalistic movements in uh, especially Europe uh, during uh, the 1930s. Um, a very, a very important uh, volume, I think. And just recently, um, a volume published in uh, Spanish uh, with the title "Franquismo en Kaleidoscopio: Perspectivas y Estudios Transnacionales um, uh, 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 Transdisciplinares sobre la Dictadura." Uh, that is uh, Francoism 
in a kaleidoscope perspective and transdisciplinary uh, studies uh, um, about uh, the uh, dictatorship. Uh, more recently, uh, she has focused more and more on the gendered dimension um, of the nation in uh, Spain. And uh, this is uh, the topic uh, which will be the subject uh, of her talk uh, this evening. Sierra, I'm very pleased uh, to have you with us and I'm very interested um, in your talk. You know, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much and good evening to everyone. First of all, I want to thank Miska Gabovitz for all the organization and to, of course, the Einstein Forum for the invitation to be here uh, today, especially in those weird and hard times. This session was scheduled for last spring, so I appreciate the flexibility to make it possible. And I thank also Tim Kessler for accepting to act as a discussant of this presentation. And I absolutely agree that it's quite an exception to find sociologists interested in history, but I am absolutely convinced that in the dialogue between social sciences and history, we can find a, a very interesting uh, results. Last but not least, I want to thank the virtual public, which is connected online this evening. So thank you very much to, to everyone. Well, the topic of my intervention is to reflect on what virility meant for the Spanish fascists at the beginning of the Franco dictatorship. By beginning of Franco dictatorship, I understand the beginning in literal terms, the years of the Spanish Civil War, that means from 1936 to 1939, and the immediate post-war period, the years of 1939, which is the end of the war, the victory of the Franco side, 1940 and 1941, years of high fascistization inside the regime, years in which the fascist component played a very um, pr prominent and important role. So I'm always thinking of this brief period of the regime. We have to take into account that the regime, the Franco's dictatorship, last in power until 1975, so I'm always just thinking in a very, very brief period of the whole dictatorship. My interest is then to pose the question of how can we understand this constant appeal to virility that these fascists made. My starting point is a commonplace. I want to shed light on the question on the basis of the assertion that virility was important for Falange, which is the Spanish fascist party. It's a commonplace because, of course, virility is one of the main features of fascist ideology. I'm going to try to share because, um, sorry, I will share my presentation because I want to show a reference, a very classic reference, uh, that one. So. I always find interesting the conclusion of Barbara Spackman in her uh, Fascist Virilities, which is a book that has almost 20 or 25 years, but I find it always useful. And it's because I said it was a commonplace because she said that the main fascist qualities like the cult of youth, duty, sacrifice, heroic virtues, strength, obedience, potency, and so on were all inflections of the master term of virility. Virility was then important in so many ways, but I am particularly interested in the link or in its link with the nation. This is to say that my goal is to reflect on what the gendered Spanish nation supposed. In these few sentences that I've expressed until now, I have already posed some of the assumptions that will articulate my proposal here tonight. First of all, I have referred to the Spanish fascism instead of Francoism as a whole. I've been just uh, referring always fascism and not the whole dictatorship, not Francoism. This is because I accept an analytical proposal that have been developed through the last years in the Spanish historiography, which suggests to interpret the dictatorship through the lens of the analytical tool of political cultures. I have Political culture is a concept that has a sociological background. It comes from the functionalist political sociology of Almon and Berba, 
they propose it as a sociological concept and as a sociological tool during the last 60s. Maybe someone in the public comes from sociology or uh, political science, and of course, it's a very well known concept. But it's a concept that has been developed also in a different way, in my view, with high success by the so called French cultural history of politics. And I am thinking of authors like Jean Francois Cyrinelli or Serge Bernstein, among others. Those authors emphasize the patterns of meaning upon the basis of which and within which political behavior develops. And they have suggested a concept that encompasses the three key pillars of the political process. Firstly, the constructed meanings and representations that make up a specific vision of the world and the interpretation of reality. Secondly, the, the political actions that are developed on the basis of this previous vision and interpretation. And finally, the expressive dimension, the symbolic fabric that surrounds and expresses political action. So as we can see, it's a concept that really encompasses these three interconnected aspects. A worldview, it means ideas, actions and humor, human behaviors, and the symbolic framework. The potentialities that a concept like this has are multiple. On the one hand, it helps to reflect on the key sociological and historical question of how can we understand the connection between meaning and action or even a structure and action or society and, and person subject. And on the other hand, and for our interest here, it lets us to differentiate that inside the same political context, in this case, the Franco dictatorship, there were different political cultures. Said in other words, it differentiates the regime from the actors, or it differentiates the continent from the content. Continent is the Franco regime, the dictatorship, and content is the political components, the political actors that play the role, a leading role inside the dictatorship. The interpretation of Francoism from this analytical perspective has served to insist on the fact that at least inside the regime, there were two main political cultures which had different political projects, different ambitions, and different symbolic structures. In first place, the political culture of the anti-liberal, reactionary, Catholic, and conservative monarchists, and in second place, the fascist political culture, in the Spanish case, represented by Falange, the this, uh, fascist party. It's important to keep in mind that those political cultures have a transnational character. In many different European countries, the last 1930s, the interwar years, can be explained in the same way. In fact, some recent works on the period have emphasized the coexistence in different places of both a conservative and a radical right, as well as the exchanges and entanglements along with the fights and tensions between one and another. I am thinking of some of the collective books edited by Aristoteles Calis and Antonio Costa Pinto, where they underline precisely this, the hybrid nature of the interwar dictatorships. Now I'm thinking, for example, in this um, kind of collective books. So said briefly, the Spanish case must be understood in a broader European context in which there were different anti-liberal right-wing forces fighting, but at the same time being part of the same political regimes. Maybe Francoism is one of the clearest examples of this hybrid nature of interwar European interwar dictatorships, but it is not uh, the only one. One of the last um, collective editions that we have coordinated in Valencia, as uh, Professor Tim Kessler uh, mentioned, uh, has been focused in, on a wide interwar context, highlighting this question is that one. You know? uh, in this book, there are several case studies, apart from Spain, like the German case, uh, Italian, French, Portuguese, and two general visions on Eastern Europe and Latin America, especially the Southern Corn from this perspective of different political cultures fighting, but always in coexistence that made so many uh, dictatorships in Europe uh, a hybrid um, uh, dictatorships. Even though for the Francoist context, its interpretation through the political culture's perspective lets us to underline also the dependence of the actors. This is to say, to underline that even if the dictatorship was not 
a fascist regime because of the presence and influence of those counter-revolutionary and conservative forces, the fascist subject existed. And it also existed from the beginning when fascism was dominant in Europe in the late 30s and early 40s until the end in 1975 when Franco's uh, died. That is what Stanley Payne, the very well-known American historian, well, American Hispanist, no? he's a historian of Spain, called the strange case of the Spanish fascism according to its longevity. So my first assumption is that it's possible to focus the research just in the Spanish fascism and not in Francoism in general, if we follow, of course, some of the recent analytical developments, which is not um, uh, is something that we can do or not. I, I follow and I find them uh, very fruitful. Of course, to focus the attention on the Spanish fascism means that we have to keep always in mind that it was a party inserted in a political structure that was not, that was not just fascist. Concerning my second assumption, uh, before I said that uh, I was going to, to make uh, two first uh, assumptions, um, I said I'm interested in the link between virility and the nation. This is my second statement. Spain was conceived by Falange as a deep gendered nation. It was conceived as inherently virile. Understanding the link between gender and nation in this way means that I use the category of gender not relative to subjects, men and women, but to the Spanish nation. I will come to the Spanish nation. I am particularly interested in how the Spanish nation was defined by the fascists using deep gendered values and attributes. So I find useful the idea that gender is a cultural interpretation on sexual difference that acts as a prism from which the world is signified. In this sense, gender can be used disconnected from sexed bodies and as Joanne Scott puts forward, masculine and feminine are not synonymous of men and women. The former is composed by the cultural meanings, representations and symbols that can be applied both to men and women. So once I've made these two first assumptions, I propose to understand virility as a cultural archetype which works as a normative ideal composed by two complementary types of attributes. Firstly, attributes refer to impetus, courage, force, vigor, and so on. And secondly, and acting as an obverse, attributes refer to austerity, self-control, sobriety, composure, and so on, those kinds of attributes. Of course, none of these two different types of values are new in their link to the notion of virility. I'm not historian of 19th century, but I think this balance between force and control, vigor, and at the same time composure has been part of the ideals of manliness in different contexts and times. It's obviously related to the military ideal that has always flown over the idea of manliness. In the case of the fascist political culture, both types of attributes were not new, but they were radicalized. It can be forgotten that violence was part of the political repertoire of the fascists. In the Spanish case, fascism was also linked to the experience of the war almost from the beginning. And it can neither be forgotten that according to its vitalistic ideology, fascism was conceived as a movement, always in the search for the future. In his work of the, on the Nazi language, and I would like to come back to the possibility to share my presentation. Here it is. Ah, those were my starting assumptions. So in his work in this, well, I've just put here the English edition of Klemperer's uh, The Language of the Third uh, Right and the Spanish edition, which is my the edition I, I have and I've been reading. So in his work, Victor Klemperer underlined this will of acting and moving and the rhetoric derived from this key aspect. So it can be said that those values of force, vigor, strength, and so on acquire a radical dimension in the fascist um, ideology. In similar terms, the military feature of fascism, we must remember that fascism understood itself 
as a militia, as a party organized as a militia, suppose that the composure and obedience were capital notions of its ideology and style also in a very radical way. So fascism was deeply virile, if we accept my proposal of considering the notion in these terms, and it applied this scheme to the nation. Before showing some specific examples, I'd like to bring up the relational nature of the category that I am using here. In this sense, the contrary to virility was not the feminine, but the effeminacy. So that's uh, my proposal, no? that the uh, relation that is fruitful and the opposition that is fruitful is not feminine masculine, but virility effemination. The nuance is interesting because effeminacy is a concept that implies not just what is different, but what is distorted. And it is not the same. It's not the same to be different than to be distorted. So in this sense, it's a notion linked to detour, linked to what supposed danger and threat because of its misleading nature. Consideration of the effemination as a form of highlighting the danger and the threat supposes to assume virility as a normative model and to underline what should be also virile, but it is not. It's precisely in this feature of distortion as, and misleading in which effemination beco becomes a menace. And this duality, virilization, effemination is especially useful for national discourses because it serves to connote the own nation with the positive and normative values and to mark the other with the buzzer attributes and the threatening nature. My proposal is that the fascist discourse on the nation was articulated around this comparison and that the effemination served to describe the enemy and to reinforce by opposition the own identity. The enemy was a double one. On the one hand, it was the liberal Spain prior to the civil war, the Spain of the 19th century, and especially the Spain of the restoration period. This is to say the period from 1875 onwards. And on the other hand, the enemy was uh, the enemy in a literal sense, the Republican side against which the fascist party as part of the Francoist bloc had fighted in the war. Both enemies were opposed to the virile fascism and to its virile Spain, but the effemination of each one was a consequence of two different mechanisms. In the first case, the case of liberal Spain, effemination was a consequence of not arriving to force, decision, vigor, impulse, typical of the virile nation. It can be said that it was an effemination due to not beginning enough in the second case, the case of Republican Spain, the political model that had been in power uh, from 1931 and 1936, and after that was part of the civil war, the effemination was not due to this lack of force, but to the lack of contention and composure, always taking into account this double version of the concept of virility that I am proposing, virility as a strength, movement, and decision, and at the same time, virility as sobriety, control, austerity, and so on. Effemination would be the lack of any of those set of attributes. Once again, the gender dimensions of this national discourse was not a novelty. In reality, it was a discourse based on a widely spread idea of the, the, the degeneration of the fatherland and the need to regeneration. So it was um, deeply, I think it was the opposition of degeneration, regeneration, expressed both through a gendered content. I believe again, that different discourses throughout the 19th century in different parts of the world were also articulated around this gendered opposition of degeneration, regeneration. I don't know if my pronunciation uh, makes clear the difference between the R and the D, but well, uh, I hope so. Maybe in the public, there are some specialists in other contexts who could corroborate this point, you know, that uh, so many uh, discourses um, throughout the 19th century respond to this gendered uh, opposition. In the Spanish case, the liberal regenerationism of the last years of 19th century and the two first decades of the 20th 
developed, in fact, a national speech very similar to the one that the fascists would do some years later. What it changed between, between one and another were the methods defended to combat this degeneration by effemination. Of course, fascism laid out the regeneration of the fatherland in, in, in anti-liberal terms. Uh, concerning to that point, there's a long and old debate about to what extent fascism can be considered as a regenerationist discourse. Maybe Roger Griffin, the um, British historian, very uh, prominent and seminal historian of fascism, was one of the most remarkable defenders of the modern character of fascism. Uh, I have to say that I agree with this version, especially because, as I said before, the analysis of the interwar period in terms of political cultures lets us to underline that the different political rights were not always counter-revolutionary or reactionary rights. In fact, fascism must be understood as a revolutionary project. Well, uh, considering my proposal, I will show some examples of this discourse. I will pose examples taken from the fascist discourse. So it's a kind of summary of the things I've been working on recently. I will show parts of the discourse taken from the sources. No, it's just a, a summary, but I will show uh, some terms, adjectives, and, and uh, considerations and determinations that I've been, um, I found in the sources. Firstly, I will suggest the effemination as a lack of force movement, courage, or strength referred to the liberal nation throughout some recurrent attributes used to define it. Persistently, both nations, the own nation and the enemy nation were defined as inherently lethargic in opposition to the enthusiastic fascist Spain, feeble or weak as in opposition to the strong fascist Spain, apathetic as the opposition to the active nation, pusillanimous nation in opposition to the brave new Spain, a soft flabby nation in opposition to the hard tense rough nation, the lukewarm nation in opposition to the engaged or committed uh, new Spain, the slow or inactive liberal decadent Spain in opposition to a, a nation uh, always in movement, the quiet Spain in opposition to the vigilant new Spain, and the easy nation in opposition to the conscient of the difficulty and the serious new Spain. So those are attributes we can find uh, very easily in the fascist discourse of the moment. Referring to the lack of composure and as typical of the Republican nation, the second type of enemy, as I said before, we can find adjectives as a tasteless, gaudy. I pose here jungled, I don't know if that exists in English. Um, in Spanish, the word would say, for the people who speak Spanish in the public, uh, would say selvatico. Uh, selva is jungle in Spanish, so selvatico is something that belongs to corresponds to the jungle. Of course, um, the, the goal is to reflect the chaotic the, and the out of control dimension no, of this adjective. So uh, jungled, histrionic, tangled, vulgar, in opposition to the sober, austere, raw, and even acerbic uh, Spanish nation in fascist terms. Ultimately, it consists in the classic opposition between civilization and barbarism, once again expressed through gendered notions and gender terminology. Virility corresponds to civilization, of course, and effemination concerns to all what defies or threat the social and political order. Anyway, there were other rhetorical mechanisms with a gender dimension. I will underline two. The first one is what I call a process of corporealization, which is a very difficult word for me to say, of the enemy nation. By corporealization, I understand a metaphorical mechanism created on the basis of bodily references through which the concept that is metaphorized, the enemy nation in this case, acquires connotations characteristic of the human body in two senses. On the one hand, by being defined in terms of bodily characteristics and physical faculties. 
And on the other hand, by being given the capacity to provoke physical emotions and feelings in accordance with these previously established attributes. I assume following Norbert Elias and his um, very well-known study on the process of civilization, that corporealization is valued negatively in line with the assumption that the growing complexity of different societies brings with it increasing control and domestication of the body. Consequently, the social evolution and development of these societies will also imply their decorporealization. As Mary Douglas described, the anthropologist Mary Douglas described in her classic work on natural symbols, this is an instance of a basic norm of civilization so that the higher the level of development of a social structure, the greater the distance established between the physical body and the social body. I assume also that any allusion to corporality, especially when it is presented at the opposite to order and civilization, has a gender connotation in the sense I exposed before. Among the mechanisms of corporealization that we can find in the fascist discourse, I'd like to underline the following. The consideration of the enemy nation as a massified nation. The Republican nation was described as a crowded nation and in consequence as a dirty, filthy and grabby nation, which are qualities linked to the body. It has a specific smell, a smell to popular oily meals like churros, which are a typical dough, a Spanish dough fried in oil linked to working class people like all the oily meals. It smells to sweat, it was the smell of those masses stacked in the subway, trying to get into the city center from the suburbs. Of course, here the component of class connected to the one of gender is pretty clear in this discourse. The danger came from those workers mobilized by the socialist Republican regime prior to the civil war, which threatened the order of the nation. One worthy difference is the fact that there was a clear distinction as Michael Richards, the British historian or historian of Spain, he's an Hispanist. So as Michael Richards suggested, between the uncontrolled mobs on the one hand and the organized and framed masses on the other. It must be taken into account that Falange, the fascist party, following the fascist logic, needed to appeal and mobilize the crowds. But it must be noted that the latter the organized masses participating in a choreography aesthetics of politics typical of fascism is linked to virile qualities like, such as order, discipline, and labor. Nothing to do with the former, conceived as an effeminate and distorted multitude, plain of bodily characteristics. The emotion that was provoked by massification and the consequent pollution and distortion of the homeland was always following the phalanges, the phalanges discourse, disgust, one of the most physical and bodily of all the emotions. In this sense, the allusions were explicit. It was really a disgust, the massified, sweaty, suburban, oily, and at the same time, histrionic and tangled nation provoked disgust. It's possible to reflect on the political and social role played by disgust as a key emotion. It has the capacity to indicate the strength of the impulse to conserve the established social order. By means of expressions of disgust, boundaries are marked between social groups and individuals, establishing distinctions between those who can remain inside and those who have to stay outside the group for the sake of the preservation of the established structure. I find in this point especially intriguing Martha Nussbaum's works on the historical role of repugnance. She points out the danger contained in the projection of repugnant qualities such as physical decay or bad smells onto particular groups, setting up associations through which other privileged groups have sought to assert their own superior human status. 
In this way, Jews, homosexuals, and individuals from lower social classes, for example, have throughout history been imagined as sustained by bodily uncleanness and thus as a source of repugnance, always following Nussbaum's ideas. So I believe that this mechanism used by Falange against the enemy nation can be understood in this way. And I also believe that it can be interpreted as part of the opposition between the virile nation and the effeminate nation in the way I've been suggesting here. Other oppositions that reflect the gender dichotomy that, that I am uh, expressing here are, for example, and this is my second and final point, or the final point I want to, to express here concerning to this opposition, is that the enemy was characterized as viscous, moist, and sticky, always considering that as a challenge to the order. If we think about it, I think I'll put it here. If we think of, about it, something viscous is something ambiguous, something that maybe having to be tough or liquid remains in the middle and misunderstanding place. It's not one thing, neither the other, no? A viscous, uh, something viscous, it's uh, in the middle, no? As I am saying, it's not tough or it's not either liquid. So it coincides with the idea that the effemination is a kind of distortion. Also, aquatic allusions were common. Once again, the water can be interpreted as, interpreted as a gendered element. In this sense, and referring to fascism, the idea was posed by Jonathan Little when he suggested that fascism used insistently aquatic metaphors to highlight the danger of the enemy. Water was taken as a source of chaos and disorder just because of its nature, something that can, that can dilute what is solid. Deepening in the ambiguity, it could be said that more than something liquid, there were also a characterization of the enemy nation, in this case, the Republican nation as a pond or a swamp. Again, a pond or a swamp are things in the middle. They are not completely liquid. They are not, for instance, just a lake. They are more misunderstanding. The water is not fresh. There are too many mud, no, it's, it's not really liquid at all because of all the mud. And at the same time, a pond or a swamp are completely inactive, something opposite to the previous characterization of the fascist nation as a nation in constant impetus and movement. Of course, what I've expressed until now doesn't run out completely the topic, the topic chosen for my talk, there would be other, so many other considerations on fascist virilities that I haven't um, treated here. But I believe that we can summarize some interesting ideas to think about the fascist virilization following what I've been exposing. First of all, the possibility to use the category of gender beyond the human subjects to understand how deeply gendered was the Franco's regime. In fact, an intriguing question that I have no time to address here is how both, both men and women took part of this virile nation without questioning their gender expectations and stereotypes. I mean, how is possible to confirm a very traditional role for women in fascist ideology and fascist regimes? I'm referring to ordinary women, not to the leaders of the feminine section of the party, which is uh, something completely different. I'm just referring to ordinary women that um, they, were, um, they had an expectation of a very traditional role, but at the same time, it's possible to see that this role was supposed to be played following the every right values. Anyway, I don't have time, but the complexities on gender roles and especially the complexities on women policies have been underlined by different scholars. Of course, there's always uh, the reference or we can always come back to the seminal work um, by Victoria Di Grazia no? and his book called How Fascism Ruled Women, maybe one of them, the, the seminal works no? that show the complexities of um, fascism and uh, gender policies. So that would be maybe the first idea we could summarize following what I've proposed here uh, this evening. 
The second idea that we can um, put here is that the opposition that I think is fruitful is not men, women, not masculine, feminine, but virile, effeminate, or virilization, effemination. The nuance is the facility that acquires the former to act as a normative model, and the facility of the latter to act as something negative and threatening because of its distorted character. The third idea I want to add, outline is that in no way we can consider fascism as a novelty in those questions. It supposed a different reformulation of a gender discourse that was part of different liberal political cultures during the previous decades. The scientific interest lies then on the challenge to investigate according to the specific fascist context, both the continuities and the ruptures. And finally, as a fourth idea, I've suggested that the Spanish case is not anecdotic. The analytical approach that uses the concept of political culture presents a perspective that lets us to understand that some of the things that happened inside the Franco's regime were common in the interwar European context. Before I finish, I'd like to make a final remark is the one that until now, I basically talked of this course. It's true that I work with discourses, but I think it's important to come back to the first notion I exposed here. I am always considering fascism as a political culture, and it means that the, that the interest is not just a linguistic or a stylistic interest. I am particularly interested in the political discourse from the conviction that it's always interconnected with political action. The fascist discourse of the immediate post-war period in Spain, a moment when the new Francoism nation had to be constructed after the war, and a moment of internal fights in order to dominate this political institutionalization, remember that I consider Francoism as a plural dictatorship, had as a goal the political action and the fascistization of the nation and the state. So even if I, if I have basically underlined the rhetoric, some of the policies and actions were on track to construct in political terms the right nation, always as an opposition to the detour nation by effemination. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Sierra, for this wonderful and very enlightening talk. Uh, I enjoyed it very much and I probably could now feel uh, a long time asking questions myself and I will really want to start with uh, one of them uh, but I first I want uh, of course invite our listeners uh, to pose uh, questions using the uh, field which in German is F and A in English it would be Q and A on the right hand side of the lower bar on your screen so please feel free to um, put uh, insert your questions there and then I will um, take them up and um, uh, and uh, and will uh, confer them to Zira. Um, uh, but let me uh, first start uh, with one question uh, which uh, immediately came up when uh, especially when you, you talked about the European dimension the larger context of uh, fascism and that fascism is not uh, a novelty. And of course, I was uh, reminded of many examples, even in the Spanish case, uh, when you look at the anti-clerical discourse of liberalism, um, I think it functions uh, um, in a way quite similarly, where you have like the strong liberal nation on the one hand, and then you have the effeminate Catholic Church uh, on the other hand. And you can make a lot of oppositions uh, that you made uh, in, in this case uh, too. Um, but then of course, um, the liberal side, uh, more or less, uh, of, of course, it's not, uh, not um, straightforward, but more or less was um, then uh, in the 1930s identified or identified with the Republic. Uh, so what would you say? Is, it, is there a kind of secret a connection between um, fascist um, discourse and uh, a more liberal uh, discourse uh, visible here? Or would you um, rather stress the uh, specificity of, of uh, fascist uh, um, political culture um, during and after the Civil War? 
Well, thank you, Dil, for your comments and for your attention um, to dynamize the, the chat. Well, I, I completely agree with you, even if I don't know very well the other side discourse, but I think the intriguing of this opposition is that uh, it has the capacity to be adapted to political cultures with a very different nature. So uh, I completely agree with you, but not just in the liberal against the um, Catholic or the uh, or not just in the anti-clerical discourse, but even if we just studied the um, discourses during the civil war, we would find a very similar discourse in both sides, which were in political terms, opposite sides. So what I think it's very interesting of this opposition is that it well, I wouldn't say a universal opposition because we are here, uh, I suppose, surrounded by historians that we can say that something is a uh, universal in this sense, but um, a very persistent opposition that can be applied to very different political cultures with very different political natures. So what I think is a challenge to be investigated is how in each political culture, in each context, take form and which are the continuities, but and at the same time, which are the ruptures, which are the similarities with maybe opposite uh, political cultures and how each political culture contextualize and readapt this persistent opposition that I absolutely uh, agree with you. So I don't think there would be any link between fascism and some liberal. Um, at least in a conscious uh, dimension, but it's true that the Spanish fascism was influenced by some of the most preeminent um, liberal intellectuals. So uh, I would say that at least the generation of the 19th, no, what in Spain is called uh, the generation of 19th, uh, it means the um, a generation of the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And of course, the a very prominent philosopher, liberal philosopher, uh, Ortega y Gasset, uh, they had a um, clear influence of those thinkers. But even if this influence were not clear, what I think it's very interesting is that how we can find the persistence of this opposition in gendered terms and how can be adapted by political cultures which are completely different. And in the case of the civil war, they're not just completely different, is that they are even killing each other. So yes, yes, I completely agree with you. And I think very interesting that um, in the anti-clerical discourse, we can find the effemination um, referred to the Catholic uh, church. No, in, in the moment of the civil war and the first Francoism, Catholic, Catholic Church was uh, suffering um, all, uh, also a virilization. Um, um, the idea of the war as a crusade makes more clear the archetype of the Christian fighter. So I think I, I, I've never been studying uh, carefully the Catholic discourse, but in the Spanish historiography, always in a broader uh, dimension and a broader European dimension, there's as well a renovation in terms of gender and Catholicism and how some of the um, apparently feminine virtues of Catholic religion were being masculinized. So I find very intriguing as well the relationship between uh, religion the Catholic discourse and this interpretation in terms of virilization, effemination. And I have to say that um, some Spanish scholars are, are doing uh, very interesting things following some of the things that uh, have been doing uh, in, for other uh, countries in, in Europe. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have now two questions and I uh, was told that I can uh, quasi uh, make them visible for everyone. Uh, I start with the question of Matthias Ditzelkamp, and he asked, uh, thank you, could you explain a little bit more the concrete political action which was caused by the gender discourse? Sí, thank you very much to, for the question. 
see, I am particularly interested in the case of Madrid, the capital, because Madrid was the, um, and the policies taken by the town hall in, in Madrid, because Madrid was the last city to be uh, conquered by the Franco side. So, and at the same time, it was the capital. So there's a discourse developed around the city during the three years of the civil war that metaphorized the city in different, with different connotations. Uh, on the one hand, it's a martyr city, but on the other hand, is the bad city, the sinner city. So there are different connotations because uh, the desire is to get into the city at the beginning of the war, and finally is the last um, city. So it represents the, the Republican city. It was the epicenter um, also of the Republican regime prior to the civil war because of its uh, capitality. So I am particularly interested in the discourse developed around the city in a very um, extreme way. It's a, a vulgar, a histrionic, a selvatic, no jungle coming back to this. Um, uh, it's a, um, full of craziness. Uh, it, it represents the scene and the disorder and some of the um, concrete local policies that start to be de developed um, after the victory, after 1939, in my opinion, um, can be interpreted in this with this gender uh, dimension. The, um, the ghost is always this vulgar and tasteless Republican city. So some of the discourses that we found in the authorities of the town hall and how they, for example, they organize the, um, the cleaning services and how uh, they um, change some urbanism, how they conceive the suburbs where the working class are, are, in my opinion, absolutely impregnate of this idea that um, is the capital, the imperial capital, but it's a sinner. Uh, a sinner city, no? or the sin is always a temptation. The detour is always a temptation in these terms of um, to challenge the sobriety, composure, cleanliness that it's supposed um, for a city like Madrid. So that could be an example, in my opinion, of this um, policies. Another example that I've been uh, working, I have to say that I am from Madrid, but I've been for seven years in Valencia, the city where I work, and I suppose you know um, this incredible uh, um, no party um, festival no, that we have here in Valencia called Fallas. No? This, um, and I've been working on the Las uh, Fallas de la Victoria, the Victory Fallas in March 1940. Fallas are always doing the um, the month of March. So the victory is April 1939. So the first fires in victory is uh, March 1945, uh, 1940. And I have found always or oh, as well concrete policies in order to organize uh, Las Fallas following this idea of um, it must be careful and warning that this tasteless, um, selvatic, chaotic, and senior nation that was shown prior to the civil war is always a ghost. So, um, so some of the organization is explicit, explicit, explicitly or um, completely focused on the sobriety and composure of the celebration. In my opinion, it can be don't also a gendered um, reading of this um, organization. And I mean, are the political elites eh, who are um, developing this discourse. So uh, I would pose these two examples, for example, that I am particularly interested in because I've been working on both. But I think that the effemination acts like a ghost and some of the a specific um, policies in this local, at least in this local dimension, are directed to avoid this effemination that challenge the composure, sobriety, and cleanliness of this new fascist Spain, which is absolutely a framed and militarized um, Spain that represents uh, the order. So I don't know if uh, 
uh, I will answer uh, satisfactory the question, but it was a very interesting question. Thank you. And our listener, please uh, let me know in uh, in the chat function, uh, the FNA function, if you uh, have uh, follow up questions. Uh, uh, regarding your your original questions, I have another question uh, quite quite uh, similar but but distinct from Jenny Baumann, and she asked. Uh, my question aims uh, to the impact that you have outlined notions on virility as a moral model among the fa Spanish fascists had on not only um, had not only on rhetorical mechanism but also on the treatment of political enemies. Did the Falange, Falange have different ideas and ideologies on how to treat, for example, political prisoners, as had conser conservative uh, Franco, fr uh, Frankist, Francoist, uh, such, a for, such as forced labor, gowls, uh, hygiene, etc., uh, to clean or work against their stickiness, moisture, weakness? Um, I think that's a very relevant question um, uh, Jenny Baumann asked. I'm, I'm reading it, so I'd um, so the, the question is how uh, did fascists and uh, conservative nationalists treat prisoners of war um, uh, f uh, uh, in a different way uh, um, uh, concerning uh, their, their basic understanding of virility and uh, feminacy? See, well, um, I'm not an expert on repression, which is a huge topic and I think my generation, um, I'm 43 years old, and my generation, which is called the generation of the grandsons and granddaughters of the civil war, is the generation of historians that have really developed um, questions about repression. So um, I don't know a lot about it, but of course, it's absolutely very well uh, researched now. So, and from so many um, ways. But I absolutely uh, agree with the question. Yes. I think this um, hygienism and this consideration that um, the, like the physical lack of cleanness is also a um, moral lack of cleanness, no disconnections between some bodily expressions and some rhetorical expressions with the conviction of punishment, the need to punishment is, um, I absolutely, um, uh, agree. Uh, there's a scholar that I like particularly on those questions. He's a British um, and English historian or English Hispanic called Richard Clemenson. No, he's, he's very well known for those things. That maybe is one of the most experts in um, hygienism and the relationship with some uh, punishment policies. So I think, yes, there's always a, a connection. So coming back to the uh, previous question, issue that could be another example of gendered policies, how this gendered discourse uh, has a translation into gender policies. Yes, um, repression policies could be interpreted as well in this gendered um, scene. Another thing, not completely the same, of the answer I'm, I'm giving and the question I think that had been posed is how also the, repress the repression was different in terms of repression, repression against women or men, no? How about this? Uh, another thing, no? Uh, that would be gender used um, refer to subjects, no? Gender referred to the connotation of a social order and a social worldview. I think yes, it has a translation into repression, and that could be another example of how a virilization, effemination is translated into into policies so i don't know if it was uh, enough my but thank you and yes coming back to i i see that no uh, in the same question it says that ah no 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 ah no no sorry sorry that's the the next one yes yeah. We have now four questions. Uh, would it be, uh, what do you think, Zira? Can we take two questions at a time um, or should we um, take them all at once? Um, yes, two questions at the same time. Uh, I think it's okay. Yeah, okay. And then you can choose. The, the next question is from Martin Schad and he asks, uh, thank you for your very interesting talk. At one point you pondered the question on how, uh, how ordinary Spanish women who supported fascism could seemingly arrange themselves 
with the stated opposition of virility and effeminacy uh, you described. I myself wondered whether this opposition is at all connected with the post gender differences in the sense of male versus female attributes. It seems rather closer to the dichotomy of straight and gay, of uh, heteronormativity and homosexual deviance. And Ström in the wings, uh, question mark. And another question by Anna Kendrick. Um, can you address any overlap with a potential conservative virility promoted before Francoism by an elite under the Republic or before? Do returning um, intellectuals like Ortega y Gasset, Maragnon, e, and other doctors or scientists in the 1940s or 50s promote or temper this tendency? I'm thinking, for instance, of Maragnon's writings on Don Juan uh, and effeminacy. Or does the role of the intellectual itself change through potentially anti-intellectual viral uh, at, uh, attitudes? Yes, well, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting questions. I will start uh, with the last one. Uh, I suppose that Anna Katrin has been reading Nereares these works, no? which uh, she's the, um, the most important Spanish scholar that um, has been working specifically on the Marañón discourse, specifically concerning to um, the figure of Don Juan. So, um, yes, I think some um, of the things we find, and I'm following Nere Aresti eh, in those things because um, I'm not a specialist in the um, liberal regenerationist discourse, but when I have said that I really find some continuities between the regenerationism expressed by those intellectuals like Marañón, Ortega y Gasset, or other regenerationists like uh, Joaquin Costa, Matias Picabea, uh, and so on. When I found in the fascist discourse clear clear continuities with those intellectuals is because they are um, posing the opposition between the effeminate Spain, the degenerate effeminate Spain and the need to regenerate the fatherland in terms of virilization in a very similar way. So what changes is the, um, the force or the La fiereza, the, the, the fierce, no? the, um, the strength, the, the potential to express that and the character. The regenerationism like Ortega, Marañón and so on, they try or they want to regenerate the fatherland in a virilization way, but in liberal terms. I think they want to regenerate the liberal system. Falange want to regenerate um, the political system to make to make a fascist state. So the solution is completely different by the, the, the diagnose is almost the same. Marañón uh, figure is quite complex and I don't know it very well, but I know that Nere Aresti has been working recently on the last Marañón, Claro Marañón. Uh, we can find it in a very, no, uh, not a very important, um, way, but we can find it in the first Francoism. And I think she's been, the last works that she's been doing, I don't know if she's going to keep on this because she works always uh, on the 20s of the last century, but uh, she's been working on the last Marañón and what she has found is that uh, Marañón and Ortega was another example of the same, was really, um, in Spanish would say maleable, very changing, no? We can found a lots of Marañons and we can found a lots of Ortegas, no? Ortega, um, it depends on the moment when he's writing, we can found uh, some things or others and he's so multiple, so that's maybe because they can be interpreted in different ways, no? Marañón and Ortega in a way can be a masters of fascism, but in another way, they are completely liberal. So uh, I think it's a... Um, it's a difficult, um, they are difficult intellectuals, but yes, uh, um, I think it's a very good question. And uh, some of the things Marañón is writing against uh, El Mito de Don Juan and this lack of composure and this um, effemination of the, of the nation, um, that could be a um, similar line. And coming to the first question, which is a complex one and a very interesting one, uh, 
I haven't think a lot about the last part of the question. I haven't think a lot because um, it's a huge topic. So I haven't think yet would be uh, maybe more uh, precise. Um, how can we understand all this discourse in terms of heteronormativity? And, but anyway, I, I think that uh, ordinary Spanish women can be understood following the opposition a virility and effemination. I think it's interesting of the, the question I, um, I'm trying to think about, the, uh, about it. Um, I haven't developed it yet a lot, but it's part of my research, is how it's compatible to define women and men following um, an absolutely archetypical and traditional dichotomy of uh, men and women have to do different things and they have to be in a very traditional interpretation of the gender roles. But at the same time, uh, they, for example, for the case of the women, they have to be uh, wives and they have to be mothers, but not in a, um, but in a virile way. I mean, they have to be strength, they have to show uh, composure, they have to show sobriety, they have to pose, uh, to show impulse, they have to show force as mothers and wives, but they have to show all that because something which is soft, flabby, uh, too sentimental, it's effeminate, men or women, but it's effeminate. Spanish women can be emotional because they have to be sober. So um, I find very useful the um, opposition, um, virility, effemination, also for the um, subjects, for men and women. There's a difficult question that I don't know yet because um, I'm working on fascism, but as a plural regime, Francoism had the other political culture, which is the Catholic and traditional and counter-revolutionary right. And it's a main part of the dictatorship. What happened with uh, men and women in Catholic terms? Are Catholics women, Catholic women, the same of fascist women? Of course not. Uh, but how can we understand men and women in Catholic terms following this opposition, it works in the same way? I don't know yet, or I don't know. I don't know if I will arrive to that because I have enough with <laughs> trying to understand the political culture of fascism. But for fascism, I think uh, the opposition, virilization and femination works for men and women. But I will think about the, um, the last part of the questions, no? Maybe there's something of, uh, yes, heteronormativity. Uh, of course, there's um, explicit policies against homosexuals and it's something uh, completely condemned, no? But uh, I, I don't have a better question for the last part of the, I don't have a better answer for the last part of the, of the question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think the next two questions fit uh, really good together. One is from Sabine Rolka. Um, she asked, are there any Prussian ideals of the good virile, virile uh, soldier lurking behind the scenes? And another question from Susan Nelman. She asked, I'd be curious to hear more about the notions of water, uh, viciousness, uh, etc., in uh, relation both to gender um, is femininity, femininity identified with water? And uh, to well Donald Trump's discussion of draining the swamp. Uh, I actually had to think about that too when you mentioned the swamp. Uh, so I'm interested to hear uh, your opinion about that. See, well, thank you very much to Sabine and Susan for their questions. Um, concerning the first one, I'm not sure if there are any a Prussian ideals uh, like that, but of course the military dimension of all this discourse is clear. Fascism is, a, um, uh, as I said before, is a um, party conceived as a militia. And I think this um, role of the good shoulder is um, flowing, no? It's uh, over flying um, over the ideal of manliness. So probably 
Yes, referring to the specific relations between Spain and, and Germany, the fascist party in this moment is absolutely uh, close to the German Nazi party. So maybe, yes, there's uh, it works as an ideal, no? Anyway, another intriguing question, and I suppose maybe it's already done, but it would, it would be interesting to see or to um, investigate in an accurate way all the different uh, military discourse and how this military archetype has been recontextualized in different political cultures. Of course, the relationship between military, the wars, the combat, and the manliness, and the um, ideal of virility, it's very well, uh, it has been well studied, but maybe there's still uh, some things uh, to do. Uh, thank you for your question. And the last question is an um, interesting and difficult one. Um, um, referring to uh, hear more about the notions of water and viscousness, I have to say that um, I am particularly interested in, in those source domains to metaphorize some, some things. The first time I found that, and I was uh, absolutely impressed because it's a wonderful book, it's a very little book, but it's quite original, is the Jonathan Little's, um, in Spanish is Lo Seco y Lo Húmedo, I don't know, in English maybe would say the dry and the humid, something like that. What Little does is interpretation of one of the books by Leon de Grels, the, the fascist leader of the um, uh, Belgic um, fascism. And Littles makes an interpretation in terms of how the water is a source domain to the metaphorization of the enemy. So yes, the water is, is feminine. The, the water is always related to the feminine, but I'm not interested just in water, but I am interested when the water should be water, but it's not water at all. And what something should be something, but it's not at all, we are not talking about masculine feminine, we're talking about virile, say, or virile, in my opinion, an effemination. Effemination is a distortion. So the viscousness, and when the water become a swamp, is because the water should be water, but it's not water anymore because the swamp it has too many mud. It's something, no, with a complex and an ambiguous nature. The viscousness is in literal terms that um, I was working, following the um, the arguments by Mary Douglas, which is a very classic anthropologist that I particularly admire. I, I think she uh, made some um, very very interesting. In interpretations, um, and I was inter making an interpretation of viscousness in that sense. Uh, uh, viscousness is absolutely what should be one thing or another, but it's not one thing, not the other. There's also um, a, a quite interesting essay by Jean Paul Sartre, uh, not the existentialist philosopher. Um, the name in, in French is Sur la viscosité, so it's a reflection. Um, in philosophical um, terms about this nature, no? So uh, yes, I, I find particularly interested to find in Donald Trump's discourse um, that come back to the idea of the, the swamp. A swamp is, is always something very negative, is something inactive, something full of mud, um, something full of um, bugs and, and, and animals. We can find also that in the um, fascist discourse that um, the Republican enemy are um, frogs and, and different kind of insects uh, because they live in, in this swamp. So my one of my key um, proposals is that even coming back to the idea that water at the end is a feminine, yes, water is feminine, but when water becomes something more ambiguous, we're just leaving masculine feminine and we're going into the distortive character that effemination has as a concept, as an opposition. And it's 
And if effemination is a distortion, it means that virilization is the norm. I mean, to be distorted, something must act as a normative model. So I find very fruitful this opposition because of that, because it underlines the both things that I want to underline, distortion and normative. Well, thank, thank you. you. Our distinguished host, Misha, has also uh, a question. Please, Misha, uh, it's your turn. Thanks, Till. I'm not distinguished, and I didn't want any privileged treatment, but for technical reasons, I can't actually type anything in the Q&A. So, Thira, thank you very much. This was really fascinating. Um, I want to, to continue a, a strand that had, has been prominent in the discussion. So, at the very end of your talk, you said that you're not just interested in discourse, you're also interested in, in practice. And you mentioned at the beginning of the discussion that these are standard ways of differentiating between friend and enemy that you find in many different ideological configurations and then they adapt to different ideologies. So I would like to hear your thoughts about two traditional and very influential interpretations of uh, this kind of you know, macho insistence on virility. So one is the psychoanalytical interpretation, right? And here in, in Germany, this has been extremely influential. So two of the probably most important intellectual bestsellers in, in post-war West Germany were basically psychoanalytical interpretations of the importance of masculinity. One was a book by the, the Mitscherlichs, uh, The Impossibility to Mourn, which was, whose argument was basically that, uh, you know, people became Nazis because of a particular type of family structure where they were constantly exposed to kind of um, aggression from a, a, an authoritarian father figure, and then they had to find an outlet. And then there was a book by Klaus Teweleit, Male Fantasies, which, which made a, a similar kind of argument, right? Uh, about a kind of distorted uh, structure of the ego, etc. So that's one tradition. And the other tradition, uh, has to do with kind of a socioeconomic interpretation, right? So last week, one of our guests at the Einstein Forum was Alexander Etkind, who has proposed a really interesting interpretation of what he calls the Petro Macho. So he looks at countries that depend on oil, oil uh, production and export. And he finds that in all of these countries, you know, Russia, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, you find this extreme Petro Macho type, right? who uh, kind of constantly stresses masculinity. And he derives that from the importance of guarding oil wells and oil transportation infrastructure. But going back to you know, previous uh, historical eras, one could talk about the traditional family in rural areas. And of course, Spain was very much still in transition from a rural economy at that time. And when that is challenged, you know, like the, the, the patriarchal family that is very typical of, you know, a subsistence economy in a rural society, when that is challenged by urbanization, mass society, etc., one of the responses is to fall back upon an even stronger masculine ideal. So I'm wondering whether any of these kind of more global interpretations of the importance of virility and masculinity apply to your case. Well, thank you very much, Miska. It's been a very um, interesting comment and a very complex question. Well, I have to say that Klaus de Belait, I found it especially um, intriguing, no? I think all of us. Um, and the book I referred before, the um, Jonathan Little's The Lo Seco y Lo Humedo, no? The Dry and the Humid, or something like that in English, is based on de Belait's assumptions. So, he takes Tevelite's assumptions to make this interpretation of Leon de Grel's um, work. So, uh, yes, I haven't been following a psychoanalytic interpretation, but for example, through uh, Bourdieu, no, the French sociologist, I agree with the idea, which in a sense is kind of psychoanalytic and maybe is the, similar to Tevelite's idea, that virility, precisely because it's a normative archetype, provokes anxiety. No, it's a very difficult for men to arrive to the, this archetype. So, 
what they propose, and uh, I find it very interesting in that way, that is always a normative discourse that uh, provokes that real uh, men can't um, arrive to that. So um, when we interpret um, a regime in terms of a political movement in terms of virility, we should take always into account that the real subjects were fighting themselves with a normative archetype, always with the feeling that maybe they are not arriving. So in that way, uh, I think it's uh, particularly interesting, especially because I'm not just working with subjects, but with the nation. So when we conceived the nation in a very normative way, uh, there's so many things that can be uh, put um, uh, outside. Uh, I have to say that, so that's um, referring the first part uh, of the question. So yes, I always find intriguing those kinds of uh, interpretations. And referring to the second one, the Petro Machos, which I found very uh, interesting, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we could think of something like that, uh, at least for the first uh, part of the regime, the first Francoism. But I think it's an idea that maybe would worth investigate for the second Francoism, when the economic development is part of the legitimation of the um, of the regime. In the second part of the dictatorship from 1959 onwards, there were um, quite to be um, a legitimation appeal because uh, I think the, the war is something that must be overpassed because it's a violent, a violent success and it was a dramatic success. And in the 60s and 70s, the dictatorship talks especially on the economic developments and the peace and the, um, the welfare state they are creating. So maybe in that moment where the regime turns back to the economic development, the transformation of virility in terms of this Petro Macho, or at least this uh, relation or this link between virility and economic success could have some, some worth in um, way. Uh, I, I, I should think about it, but I found it very interesting. What also works for the Spanish case, the second part of the dictatorship also, is the virility link to or the virility links to the idea of, of a good ruler. No? Of course, it always worked like that. But the second part of the dictatorship is less ideologicized and more bureaucratic and more um, technocratic. So virility, force, strength, and so on is readapted to a discourse that emphasized the the gestion, no, emphasize the, the bureaucracy. Uh, but as I have said, the economic development is one of the main cards that the, the dictatorship is playing. So maybe this uh, transformation of virility linked to um, the development could make, um, or could open a new way or a new path for investigating. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh... Oh, thank you, Sira, especially for this wonderful talk, for answering uh, extensively our question. Thanks for the questions of the listener. I have just one uh, little question left. Uh, when will the book be published where you will present all your um, um, findings? Uh, is there a plan to, to put this into, um, into or make this into a, a book uh, that you have? And well, that's a desire. I hope so. It's always my desire, but my impossible goal. Let's see. I've been publishing on those things last years, and I've been reflecting on that things. And now my, my desire would be to put everything in a, in a book. Let's see, life is complicated and you all know, we all have classes, family, bureaucratic tasks, and it must be like that, no? Um, we belong to the public institution and we have to do things for the public institution, of course, and uh, we have to, to and, and research is not the only one, but uh, let's see, I would really like, I would really like, so maybe <laughs> I have the good news. I hope so. 
yeah, yeah. We were what uh, we would be looking forward to to reading your book, and I think your talk uh, showed once again that uh, it's important not only to look at the uh, quote unquote big dictatorships in European history, like the German case, uh, the Italian case, uh, or. Um, and then in another po uh, political context, Soviet Russia, but also to look at uh, Spain as a Franco dictatorship, because I think we can learn a lot, not just about Spain, but about uh, European history or, or global history, if we uh, aspire to such a goal uh, when uh, in examining uh, um, Franco Spain. And I think the fascist case uh, is a really intriguing one um, uh, uh, for, for many reasons. And I think you showed us uh, quite a lot uh, reasons why it is important to study this period. Well, I think uh, we uh, we are coming and we have come to an end. Uh, uh, thank you once again. And we unfortunately, as it is uh, during this pandemic, we can't go out and have a drink, which would be now really nice. I really would like to talk to you and to our um, uh, other participants uh, in person and drink a, a good uh, beer, Brandenburg beer in Potsdam or a wine. Uh, but we'll do that uh, at a later date. Uh, thanks again very much for participating in this event and we'll see each other, I think, uh, in a, a different uh, environment, different uh, for different occasions. Misha, last word for and you. Thanks very much to both of you for a really fascinating event. And you know, thank you, Till, for your, your optimistic uh, outlook. I do hope that we'll be able to, uh, to all meet in person. Uh, just before signing off, I would like to advertise our next event, which will take place uh, this Wednesday, the 13th. And that will be a talk in our series, People, Things and Animals by Frédéric Keck, an anthropologist from Paris, who has a really fascinating anthropological look at the current pandemic based on his research in East Asia on animal-human interaction. So having said that, thank you everyone. And I hope to see everyone very soon. Goodbye. Well, I want to thank, before we, we disconnect, I, I really want to thank you all and Tim Kessler for the discussion and of course Miska and all the questions, all the public. It's been, sorry for my English. I haven't been talking English for a long time. So I hope I will make everything comprehensible, understandable. And thank you very much. It's been a, a big pleasure even if we have to see each other through the screen. But thank you very much for the invitation.